Thanks, Nancy. Okay, you can hear me. Um, I'll just apologise in advance. I've had a persistent dry cough, so if I need to pause and cough, um, I will. So, my name's Jenny. I work out at Northam in Deep Herd. Um, this is a trial site we've got not far from here in Ben Cubham, where we're looking at um, Tony Sasha's place, looking at um, heavy soil and, and what we can do to uh, create structure through tillage and, and um, amendments and plant species um, with gas in our um, GRDC, GRDC work. Um, but today I'm here to talk about soil health and I'm taking a big picture overview, so taking a very general approach and just talking through a few things. So firstly, what is soil health? So how many here have buried their undies to see what happens after two months of growth? Nope. <laughs> well, that could be an indicator of um, soil health according to the cotton industry where we have a gradient uh, in the no, in the top um, through to the bottom of um, various decomp decomposition rates and then a slightly um, more sophisticated version of um, burying tea bags and seeing the relative difference between um, a green and rubus tea decomposing. But as these researchers identified, although we may see a change happening by burying some organic matter into the soil, it's probably an indication of soil function as opposed to overall soil health. And as they rightly indicated, it's probably just a particular function in this particular soil. I think a lot of us probably associate soil health with something. If you had a moment or a bit of pen and paper or we ask them every individual, you might give me a different response and it means something different to you. But I sort of, the researcher in me, wanted a, a definition. <laughs> so the ITPS defines soil health as the ability of the soil to sustain the productivity, diversity and environmental services of terrestrial ecosystems. So that is, soil health is defined by the land use that we use it for. In managed systems, soil health can be maintained, promoted or recovered through the implementation of sustainable soil management practices. And as with human health, there is no single measure that captures all aspects of soil health. The preservation of these soil services requires avoiding and or combating or types of soil degradation. So I've uh, um, made larger probably some of the, the key points I took out of this. One, soil health will differ depending on the, the land use it's used for. What we may consider healthy in our system would be different to the Amazon, as an example. Um, we have a responsibility to um, avoid any further degradation and that it can be maintained, promoted or recovered. And just like when you might try and pinpoint what makes a healthy human what does actually make a healthy soil? What are, what are those targets that we're actually trying to achieve? So here's a long list of uh, 42 parameters that um, some researchers are trying to pull together in um, analysing lots of different literature on all of these um, pieces of research work and varying land uses and trying to infer what that might be for soil health change. It's a lot to go through and each one can tell a different aspect of the soil health, soil functioning. But generally we can break it down to different parts of the physical. So soil texture, the bulk density, water holding capacity, chemical, so the nutrients, cation exchange capacity, trace elements, to the biological, so these could be good or bad, the weeds, the diseases, all the microbial functioning, um, earthworms, termites in our systems through to the environmental, so is there erosion, um, any emissions coming from the soil, um, soil temperature, and then why are we actually wanting the soil health, and that's for the thing that we're producing off it, the productivity. To me, that's still a lot of lists. So we have the big picture, what is soil health, what are we trying to achieve, what are the individual measurements we're trying to um, get to, but to think about soil, um, I just like to come back to looking at the ground and seeing how it can all work and all interact with each other. So here we have the soil and that's the physical. Everything you see there um, is the physical component, the texture, the porosity, um, water holding capacity. Then that interacts with the chemical. So the, the chemical might be the inherent fertility or anything we may add or need to amend or any toxicities that could be there in the chemical. Um, and then the biological overlaying with that. The sweet spot in the middle is the soil health. So it's the interaction between all three components of the soil, even though, um, sorry, like thinking about health in general infers the biological, it really needs to be supported by the physical and the chemical. 
and that these all interact. So an example is the biological, um, as mentioned this morning, we can create um, through the plant roots, we have um, root exudates, they can create soil structure, um, soil aggregates. But if that physical, um, if there's a physical constraint there um, and the um, biology can't actually interact or get into the um, soil itself, then that's going to impede any um, benefits in creating any additional soil structure. Just an example of the interaction between chemical and biological is the effect of pH on microbial functioning. So here's some data of total organic carbon increasing at low pH. So that's an acidic soil with increasing carbon. And you might think that's great. I've sorted my carbon and I can store a lot of credits. But what's actually happening? If you look at the microbial biomass, um, there's a positive relationship. So as pH is increasing, generally they're finding more microbial biomass. And then if you look at the microbial carbon use efficiency, that's actually decreasing in the acidic soil. So that means the microbes aren't breaking down the carbon efficiently, they're emitting a lot more carbon, and they're not functioning as a... Um, yeah, their role in that soil is just not a function. So what we're seeing here with the increase of total organic carbon it's actually a negative. It's just that the soil itself isn't functioning. So in this particular soil, um, you'd want to bring up that pH and so that you can have a functioning healthy soil rather than just looking at the total organic carbon alone. So just a snapshot more specifically on carbon and where it fits in in the soil health. Um, so carbon is one component of soil organic matter. It's, where it's, it's about 50%, 58% carbon. Um, and then there are other components. There's nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and additional elements as well. And so, although there's carbon in there, um, the breaking down of um, mineralization that's providing the plant extra elements, and then likewise, if we're trying to increase our carbon, um, we also need to have all those other elements added as well. Uh, the soil is a sink and a source, so that means we can store it, but then also part of the process of creating all that organic carbon, uh, we are emitting carbon dioxide. That's not necessarily a bad thing because that's what's creating our nutri um, nutrient cycling, but it's just, it is what it is. Um, and soil changes, small changes uh, incrementally to build the levels. It's not, we, soil carbon decline doesn't happen overnight and it's not going to be built up overnight. But doing what we can now, over time, to preserve and improve, then that's where in the future we'll be reaping the awards. I'll just skip over this one. So this was just a quick conversion of... I'll go through it. Um, just converting... So more typically we get our soil tests and it's just the organic carbon percentage for the, say, 10 centimetre layer. And I just wanted to go through just converting it through to a carbon unit. Um, so we have 1% carbon and then you times it by bulk density. So that's um, how much soil is weighed in a certain volume. So um, just focus on one is 1.2, um, and then we get the total carbon store. So in this particular example, the one on the left is, so this scenario is if you resampled after it's been compacted, and it's just showing the difference uh, of knowing the bulk density before and after doing a sampling and the importance of knowing uh, that you are actually getting a representation of an accurate measure. So in the previously first sample where it hasn't been compacted, you're only sampling this top 10 centimetres, whereas once it's been compacted, you're actually sampling a little bit more. And then, so you need to do another adjustment to go back <laughs> to the equal 12. I don't know if I explained that properly. Oh, um, and then just another conversion, that if you're wanting to think about sequestering a tonne of carbon into your soil, that's approximately a 0.08 percentage increase in organic carbon, depending on what you're starting with. I just based that on a 0.8 start, um, just to go through. So what are we talking about when we're talking about the carbon fractions? So organic matter in the soil, we have three four components, um, and they each do a different functioning and they all break down at different levels. So the first stage of building the organic matter into the soil is the fresh residue, living organisms um, and roots 
entering the soil system. This circulates and breaks down um, over many, many times as the fractions get smaller and smaller, and that's the breaking down and release of nutrients and starting the nutrient cycling. This is called the particulate fraction, it can range from 19 to 34%, and this will continue, um, and anything left over that the microbes don't continuously need, so if we're trying to build, that some of that will end up in the humus fraction, which is the more stable fraction in the soil. It's more stable, it becomes a small size, so it's protected by the soil particles that are in there. Um, and it's not that they're completely resistant to further microbial... Um, uh, what's the word? Breakdown. Yeah, breakdown. <laughs> So I'm thinking a few things ahead. Um, Breakdown that um, it's just a much slower process and much more resistant. Through that process of the continual nutrient cycling, that's when the excess nutrients, those other elements that I've mentioned, will some of that will become available to the plant, and then some will get lost as carbon dioxide to the environment. And then this will continue over time, and then eventually there'll be a resistant fraction. Um, in the soil, this is more uh, just like the charcoal and it's very, very resistant to any change. And then for about 5%, there's just the dissolved, which is like root exudates and any waste. The different fractions in the soil, so each soil may have a different uh, composition of each fraction and then depending on what that is, each will have, um, the soil itself will have, will have a different function. So those fractions on soil function, here's a figure we have clay contents on the left, so starting with zero clay contents, that's the sand going up to 100% clay at the top. And I'll just go through just some of the functions of each particular um, fraction and how its relative importance in each texture type. So here we have the physical, the biological and the physical, and it's on soil structure and water holding capacity. Um, and the water holding capacity, as you can see, is it's more important in a sandy soil because the clays already hold quite a lot of um, sand on their own, I mean, water on their own. The cation exchange capacity, so cation exchange capacity is the ability to retain and release cations, which is important for nutrient retention, nutrient release. Clays themselves already have negatively, negatively charged particles, so they do that themselves, whereas the organic matter in a fraction in the sand, this plays an important role. Provision of nutrients, both to the microbes and the crop, and then energy for biological processes as, as it's continued for cycling. This is just an example of what happens to each of those fractions um, with the change in rotation. The top line here so far is um, the total organic carbon, and um, this is a simulated model based on um, a site out at, of at Adelaide and so for the first 33 years they just put a wheat fallow phase and we can see that the total organic carbon stocks are declining over time. Then when they entered going to a permanent pasture phase so having continuous crop growth which is what can build carbon in our soil it starts to increase and then when we look at the particular well and then what we see here is at two different time points time 15 and 43 that organic carbon level is exactly the same. And then if you look at the resistant component, that stayed the same through the entire time. It's not becoming, it's not being touched. But then if you look at the particulate, so that's that very um, initial labile phase um, against the humus, the more stable, we see that they're different. So in terms of the soil function, these, although the overall organic carbon is the same, the soil function will be different. And so what we have here is you can see that in, t in the wheat fallow phase where it was sort of burning down, running down that organic carbon, is this particular fraction that we're using first, followed by the humus. And then likewise, in terms of building it back up again, is the particulate, the, the quick, the um, first stuff that's increasing first, and then the humus is slowly building in itself. Just to think about what... Um, we can store in our soil, we can think of it in terms of potential, attainable and actual soil carbon levels. So similar to like genetic environment by management, 
what, what can we theoretically achieve? So the potential is set by the soil type. So that's the clay content, bulk density, mineralogy, and depth, which is important. So sands just have a less inherent capacity to store carbon compared to the clays. They're larger particles. They, um, everything can break down a lot quicker. Um, attainable will be the environment. Um, so rainfall, heat, uh, cold, wet climates are more conducive to storing a lot of carbon, as we know. Um, and then the actual, that comes down to management. But probably where we want to be sitting is where are we now and where do we want to be with storing our carbon? So we have the option of preserving the resource. Don't let it get down any further than what it is. Maybe we can think about how we can optimise our management to become up to the attainable. And maybe we can add an external carbon source and be potential. Now this might be, we might actually already be at our attainable level for our topsoils and ex as an example. And maybe this, the challenge will be actually where can we get our carbon deeper into the soil as opposed to um, just the topsoil, it might just become more of a depth question. Just in terms of what happens into um, a carbon going into that in terms of management. So each system will reach a stage of equilibrium. So after the land has been cleared, it's gonna reach 50, 100 years to reach a status quo of equilibrium. But then where the manage, management uh, question might change it, is so this might be the lower equilibrium where we're not doing anything it's it's reached its plateau and will stay like that perhaps by having the optimized management we can come to this paddock line it might fluctuate based on the seasons periods of high productivity down to low productivity and then maybe this upper equilibrium is a scenario where we might be adding extra amendments the thing about um, the extra amendments is although that will reach a new upper equilibrium as soon as we stop adding those, the paddock will go down in decline. And just a real life example showing this is a 100 year trial at Rothamsted, um, continuous barley. And we have here at the bottom a control treatment, just the barley grown, optimised for fertility with the NPK fertiliser. And then farmyard manure applied at 35 tonnes of the hectare annually. But then after, I think it was 33 years, they stopped doing that and you can see it declining. And the reason why it's not declining straight away down to here is because of that stable humus faction that I talked about earlier, that it may continue to slowly build, but it's more resistant, so it's taking a lot longer to get back to those original levels. So just putting it all together and just starting to think about what could we actually do, this is just um, broad level on a bit about the carbon cycle. We have our system, we have our soil, we have the physical, the chemical and the biological. We have the environment and we have our management. In terms of conceptually thinking about it into prevention, maintenance and then building, um, prevention really would be the interaction between the topsoil and the plants. So just doing what you can to avoid erosion further, because that's a huge loss of topsoil. Um, Stubble management, sustainable grazing, minimum tillage, which people would be doing. And then in terms of maintenance building, essentially just building plant material, um, improving the water use efficiency, managing the constraints to crop growth that we have, diversity, optimum fertility, any alternatives to fallow, addition of carbon sources if they can be economical, and perhaps it is a conversion to another system. So I should just say I I've, I've work in the grains industry and uh, this is pretty focused on, on cropping, but it, could, it can apply to, to the other systems. And just to summarise, um, I just wanted to give an overview that soil health, it gets thrown around a lot as a word and everyone has their own meaning, but probably creating your own meaning and have a, having a target for what it might mean to you and your system. Um, and that really the biological, physical, chemical do interact continuously. Biology in itself is always going to be limited by the most limiting factor. So whether it is the environment, whether it's a chemical constraint in the soil, whether it's compaction. Um, but we can work with that and work around that with um, continuing to adapt as people have already been doing. Um, and that small steps to either maintain, preserve as step one, but then um, if we can try and build or find ways that we can build incrementally 
in time, um, it will lead to a resilience in our system. So just to make a, a, a plug for the, some of these soil quality books that we've been producing, if you have an iPhone or an e um, iPad, a lot of the, there's been six released and there's another four to come, but they've got a lot of information out there based on the physical, the chemical, the biological, and as they keep coming out, so just in terms of the biological specifically, there's soil organic matter, soil biology, the soil compaction book is excellent, it has a lot on just so um, physical itself, just the bulk density and um, texture, um, solicity, and then there's others to come. Thank you.